I just quit my job at Google, so now I'm gonna expose all of their ultra secret technologies. Just kidding, all of these can be found in this GitHub repo. Before Google was known for suckling on your sweet, sweet data, they were known for revolutionizing distributed computing again and again and again. And they did it by using six revolutionary tools that most people never heard of, but I'm gonna show them to you today. Let's start with a classic, the Google file system. It's 2003, most people are still learning how to open their file explorer but Google has a different problem. Search engines need a web crawler to navigate through every web page available and save it so that it can be converted to a weighted graph and used within PageRank. Now that's quite a lot of data to store. Today, that would be on the order of petabytes of data. On top of that, these files need to be concurrently read and written to by many machines from many developers at Google, requiring high throughput, consistent data, and replicated files. The high level implementation is that files are split into 64 megabyte chunks before they are stored. Each chunk is assigned a universally unique ID, and a given chunk is not only stored on one server, but it's stored on at least three servers. There's also a single master server, which sort of acts as the table of contents. It tells you the directory structure, maps every file to a list of its corresponding chunks, and of course, tells you the chunk locations as well. It kind of reminds me of the super block in a Linux file system, but in this case, our file chunks are distributed, which makes things a lot more complicated. Now, Google didn't just keep their secrets to themselves. They published a very revolutionary paper, which inspired engineers at Yahoo to develop the Hadoop distributed file system, which was later open sourced. The original GFS was also successful succeeded by Google's Colossus file system. Okay, but storing data is easy. How do we actually process the raw web pages? Well, conveniently, a year later, Google released the MapReduce white paper. The problem is that you have to process a lot of data, like from Google file system. And you could use a single machine to do it, but then you might never go home. Instead, you can use the most powerful big data processing framework at the time that your company just happened to invent. And don't worry, it's actually pretty simple. As the name implies, there's two main steps, mapping the data and reducing the data, at least from your perspective as a programmer, but there's a hidden middle step called the shuffle or sort step. Let's say our input is a bunch of raw text files. For the map step, we would split our data up into individual chunks and each server would receive a portion of them. The output from each server would be a list of intermediate key value pairs. Now, before the reduce step, we will shuffle or sort the data by making sure that every pair with the same key value ends up at the same server server for the reduce step. This is important because when we reduce or aggregate our data, we do so by the key. So the input here is the intermediate key value pairs and the output is the final key value pairs. Congratulations, you just wrote a distributed program to count words, exciting. But the reason MapReduce was so revolutionary is that from a programmer's perspective, you are only responsible for implementing two functions. And these are analogous to the map and reduce functions from functional programming. You didn't have to be a distributed systems expert to use this tech. And shortly after Hadoop MapReduce, an open source variation was released. Nowadays, no one really uses MapReduce anymore. Google uses Flume. Apache Beam is the open source equivalent and Cloud Dataflow is the Google managed job runner. Meanwhile, the rest of the world uses Apache Spark and Flink for the same purposes. Okay, enough about infrastructure, show me some code. Well, you've probably heard of RESTful APIs, but if you really want to bust your balls, watch me build the same API with gRPC. We're using Proto version 3, and this is our Hello World package. We start by defining our schemas for our RPC's request and responses. Then we can create a service, which is where we define our RPC's. Say hello will basically receive a name and return a greeting message. Now in our service code, we start with some boilerplate, like importing the protocol buffers that we just declared. Then we can define and register our hello world RPC handler and create a gRP server which listens for requests. Now that's definitely a lot more work than the REST equivalent. And on top of that, gRPC is not natively supported from browsers. Now, if you were paying attention though, you might've noticed that we actually have schemas and type safety. That's one of the purposes 
uses of protocol buffers. It might be less obvious though that gRPC is more efficient because data is binary serialized rather than being human readable like JSON. Okay, but what does this have to do with Stubby? Basically, it's the Google internal version of gRPC because Google really doesn't like open source for some reason. Or maybe they're too lazy to migrate over. If someone from Google is watching this, let us know. Enter Borg. It's comparable to a really popular open source tool that Google created. Can you guess which one? Let me give you a hint. It schedules and manages hundreds of thousands of jobs spanning thousands of machines where a job is the smallest deployable unit of computing. It consists of one or more tasks where a task is a runnable instance of a binary, like a server or a batch job. So if you guessed Kubernetes, nice job. Yes, Kubernetes was influenced by Borg and was open sourced in 2015, where a Borg job is kind of like a Kubernetes pod and a Borg task is kind of like a Kubernetes container. But instead of Docker, Google uses this container stack. If you can't tell, at Google there's a culture of creating the most esoteric names possible for everything. But I will say that at Google I never saw anything that resembled a Docker file, so this might be a rare case where the tech really just works. Borg has some more parallels with Kubernetes, which you can read more about in the white paper. But to summarize, Google doesn't use the complicated Kubernetes tool and instead uses something even more complicated. Yeah. Now finally, the moment you've been waiting for. Databases. Bigtable was created when Google ran into the limitations of relational databases. It was designed to support millions of requests per second and be extremely scalable. Now just like SQL, data is still stored in tables of columns and rows. Related columns can be grouped together via a column family. Each row column intersection can have multiple versions of a value. So it's kind of like a three dimensional table where the third dimension is time. Another difference from SQL is that it's sparsely populated because not every column has to be required by each row, and we have the flexibility to add columns as needed. Now under the hood, data is stored in an LSM tree where writes are batched into the mem table, where they're stored in sorted order before being flushed to the SS tables, where they will be immutable. Like I said, storing data is easy, guys. The 2006 Bigtable paper inspired the 2007 Dynamo paper, which later led to DynamoDB, and it also inspired the development of Cassandra, and I'm sure Amazon continued to give back to the open source community after that. This is the part where I was going to have a MongoDB sponsorship, but I'll just plug my site instead. I recently added a full stack development course where we build out a YouTube skeleton and we focus on the part that most people avoid, the back end, specifically focusing on the upload feature where videos are asynchronously transcoded and then served to users. You can read more about it in a short design doc I wrote, which is free. I think this is the type of project that most people definitely don't have on their resume, so it might help set you apart. And now number one, right after a few honorable mentions. Spanner is the crackhead database that uses GPS and atomic clocks to literally break cap theorem. Dremel is a data warehouse similar to BigQuery, the crown jewel of Google Cloud. And there's Blaze, Google's build tool that I never fully learned how to use and was open sourced as Basil, finally a name that makes sense. And now for the final one, Google Domains. Just kidding, it's dead. Let's finish with the most secretive tool on this list, Goops. Okay, seriously, who's coming up with these names? There's not much public info on it, but Cloud PubSub is the public version and is pretty much equivalent. At its core, PubSub is a message queue, so it's comparable to tools like RabbitMQ and Kafka. Without a message queue, your architecture might look like this. But if we wanna handle high throughput, add a durability layer, and decouple our services, we can introduce PubSub to our architecture. To summarize, we talked about how Google stores data, whether we're talking about files or transactional data. We talked about how Google moves data with gRPC, protocol buffers, and message queues. We talked about how Google processes data originally with MapReduce and later Flume. And lastly, Borg, which is how Google orchestrates all of the above. Thanks for watching. This was a fun one, and hopefully I'll see you soon.